I started out in physics. Physics, I know. <laughs> and then, uh, but I, I went to a school where there was, uh, you study a quarter and then you work a quarter. And you study a quarter and so you go back and forth. And the jobs were all over the country. This is uh, as an undergraduate. And I worked at MIT at the time when molecular biology was just rising. And the beauty of molecular biology was that it had the influx of physicists, uh, med people in medicine, chemistry, biology, genetics, all coming together with very different viewpoints, but working on a common problem and gave rise to a new field. And it was very seductive, and I was carried into it. And, uh, and the other thing that it uh, prevented, you, you had the feeling that you could answer any question. I mean, we really thought we, you know, we could do anything. So it had a, a, a seductive a feel to it that now you're on the verge of a new biology. I think now the push is always now to more specialize rather than to generalize. And that my feeling is always where the things that are interesting is the intersection of different disciplines uh, coming together and looking at the field from different eyes. And then all of a sudden they see something that uh, a specialist may not see. So I think my feeling is we should still not specialize too much, but really ask the questions and let those drive you as opposed to your discipline driving you. And so I think in, you know, in one way it has changed uh, there are many more tools now available. I mean, the technology is, is changing extremely rapidly, uh, and, uh, and, and we welcome that change. I mean, science isn't a smooth curve. It's actually, uh, you go along, and then all of a sudden there's a jump, and then you go along, and then another jump, and those jumps are associated with new technology infusing into the field. And then all of a sudden you can see things or measure things that previously you couldn't see. Everywhere you turn, you, you find questions. And I think what you have to find are those questions that you're really passionate about. And uh, right now, for example, now I'm becoming passionate about neuroscience. I've been changing fields all every 10 or so years. And in, in order to you know, completely scramble all of those neurons in my brain and then look at something new, and being naive is often, often an advantage. You don't know the questions you shouldn't be asking, whereas the people in the field already know what you shouldn't be asking, but you may come up with a new question. And you know, in science, if you ask the right question, you're on the right road. Uh, if you ask the wrong question, you're on you know, the wrong road in the sense either that you don't have the tools to answer that question, or alternatively, it's not an interesting question. So we spend a lot of time on what should we ask, and, and what are we ready to ask, and what will be the consequence of those answers. Well, I th you know, the difficult parts is always getting money. Uh, and I think uh, that's always the great limiting thing because I think, you know, the questions, the technology the, uh, is always getting better, but it's also getting more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I spend more time writing grants and trying to get money and try to support the lab as opposed to doing the work. So I think that's the drawback. And I think the other, you know, is uh, in my lab, I have 15 people normally a steady state, usually five graduate students and five postdoctoral fellows in 11 languages. Okay, so I'm drawing people from all over the world and, and they've looked, you know, so it's not only that they have different disciplines, but also different cultural exp uh, experiences. And again, looking at a common problem. So here you have all of these eyes looking at this from different venture points and it'll create, it has to create something new. Uh, and so I think, you know, science is beautiful because you're always building on the next, you know, it's not that it, it's a complete new creation, it's building on one layer and extending it beyond that and then th the next generation takes it to the next step. And so we're always adding to it and, and making it stronger and more robust. And, uh, you know, people often have saying, well, this is theoretical, this is, it's all, it's, it's always data. 
and there is real data and it has real interpretations. You know, I spend initially, whenever a new student comes into the lab, I spend a lot of time just talking about what are they passionate about. If they have the passion, then they'll have also the curiosity, they'll be asking questions. You never know when a good idea will get into your brain. But if you're not thinking, it will never come. Okay. So you have to, it has to be from inside, and then it'll be there, and I just have to release it. <laughs> so it's not that, you know, humans are incredibly curious. I mean, you know, we're always, no matter what comes up, we always want to play with it. And in science, it's sort of, it's almost like being a child your whole your life. You're always playing, you're always solving puzzles. And so, and that stimulates itself. I mean, and, and the reward from all of a sudden seeing something that nobody else has ever seen before is, that's the real reward. <laughs> you know, Nobel Prizes are terrific, but the discovery, that's what's really amazing. It's really complicated. I mean, it's, it's immensely complicated compared to cancer. You know, we thought cancer is complicated, but it's it's minuscule compared to how the brain works. It's you know, it's an, an enormous machine, and uh, it's very clever. And you know, the number of connections, if you know, are just astronomical. And so I think it, it has inherent complexity, and we're just now gathering the tools to actually be able to approach that. I mean, I'll give you an example. If you go into an MRI machine, you stay there about 15 minutes thinking about an apple, and now they tell you you're, this is the part of the brain that's thinking about apple. Okay, when we're talking, we actually exchanging information in milliseconds, okay, a thousandth of a second. Here it takes 15 minutes. So we have to now compress uh, our, not, you know, our ability to see how the brain works at that speed compared to the speed that we're now currently working with. It's you know, millions of fold differences. And so there's enormous amounts left to do, but at least now we can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in something that's as complex as our brain. There are a lot of microglia, and they're interesting cells because they're interested in what we call homeostasis, maintaining uh, constant conditions. Our, you know, we don't want things to go completely wild or else we can't control it, and microglia are there to maintain that order. Uh, and so they're going to be an enormous tool for be able to, I mean, if you have a neural circuit and it's broken, it's going to be very hard to, con to, to fix it. But the microglia can fix it, and they can also overcome it or, or bypass it. So there are many, there are cells that can sort of modulate the brain in ways that uh, neurons that are too difficult to modulate. And so it's, a, it's going to be a conduit to be able to do many, many things in terms of particular pathology that you can't approach any other way. We have to figure out how microglia talk to neurons. Mm -hmm. Okay, the neurons are the circuits that are responsible for your behavior. Mm -hmm. But microglia can talk to them, so they have a, there's a language. So we have to figure out how they talk to each other. And then once we understand that, then we can start giving them the kind of talk that may be useful to clear up a pathology. And my feeling is it's gonna be a conduit to be able to actually create more stable condition for your brain and to be able to, for it to thrive and be creative. I think actually a little bit of discomfort is good. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps you on edge and keeps you wanting to strive. I mean, if we're really, you know, if we're, you know, heaven to some people is looking at TV having a beer, some potato chips, and just enjoying yourself. But, and that's fun, but it won't get you anywhere. If you're a little bit discomfort, then th that means that you're gonna be pushed to try to correct that discomfort, and that will make you expand and reach out. Too much discomfort is bad, but a little bit of discomfort keeps you going. And I think uh, all human beings actually uh, know, 
motivated by a little bit of discomfort, uh, either with the, you know. And I think sometimes, you know, we have a tendency of almost trying to spoil our own children. We want to give them everything, and that may be actually a bad thing. No, I think education is the key to everything. I mean, I think because, you know, it's, the world is becoming more and more dependent on information and being able to handle that information in a productive way. And that'll take even more education as opposed to less. You know, and, and what education does is simply open the doors mm -hmm. and then gives you choices. And then you can go through whichever door you want, but without education, you don't even stand a chance. And so, you know, uh, that's the big thing that happened you know, when I came to the United States, I had not no schooling, zero, up to the age of nine. Uh, and then all of a sudden, here, next day I was in school, okay? But that's essentially the beginning. Uh, and then, and those opportunities, and, and, and a child, if they're given the opportunities, they'll take them. Mm -hmm. But you have to have those opportunities given to you. And, and that's one thing we have to guarantee, is that all children get an education and have a choice. I was also put into a, an ideal situation. I mean, uh, you know, I go from a completely asocial situation into living in a commune where I had 65 parents, okay? And, and all the kids had activities together. So all of a sudden, you know, you have all possibilities and we actually still keep to get in contact with each other, even though we're spread out all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's that opportunity, that ability to, and that community just, you know, it was a Quaker community, so they were, things didn't matter, but the mind and the spirit mattered. And that's what they were feeding, and that's what they were giving to the kids, and that's what they took and then ran with it. And I think, you know, you do have a lot of talent here. I mean, in terms of your young people, you're not a scientist. And I think the thing to do is to make sure they're taken well care of.